Good afternoon, Colorado. Um, welcome to Working Together on State and Federal Food Policy Webinar. This is Wendy Peters Muschetti. I'm Director of Food Systems here at LiveWell Colorado, um, and I'm going to be kicking off this webinar. Before we um, introduce our other speakers and dive into content, just a couple of quick logistics. For those of you who are Zooming in today, um, those of you who are familiar with Zoom, um, you know that there is a chat function, um, also a Q&A function. There's two different ways to type in questions. We're asking that if you have questions for others on the line or for any of the presenters, please use the chat box. Um, it's a little bit challenging to try to monitor two different boxes, so um, we do welcome you, however, to make comments, submit comments or questions um, throughout the webinar as we speak. We've, 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 we've given ourselves over an hour for today, so we won't have ample time to get through content and address all of your questions. We will have time for open Q&A at the end, but please do submit any com comments or questions in the chat box as we go. So as I said, I'm Wendy, Director of Food Systems. I am joined by two other presenters today. We have Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Livermore, and I'm the Director of Food Policy here at Livewell, Colorado. I work with Wendy and Gabby and the rest of our policy communications teams on developing and implementing uh, food systems policy in Colorado and at the federal and local levels. Yay. And we also are going to be joined by Megan Lovelace, um, all the way from Washington, D.C. She's doing a policy internship with the National Farmers Union there, and I will do a little bit more of an intro on Megan um, a little bit later in the webinar. So moving on to our objectives for our time here together today. So we have a few objectives um, in our next 75 minutes or so together. We would want to share information about the state political process and the state policy environment. So how does this all get done in the Colorado level? We also then want to talk about what we have been up to, have been up to, and are planning on being up to at the state level around state food policy priorities here at LiveWell. We then want to move into the federal environment and talk about sort of the federal political process and how legislation works at the federal level and current things that we know about the federal policy environment today. Then we'll share some of what we are up to, um, LiveWell's platform around, the federal food, around federal food policy. And then want to leave a chunk of time towards the end to really talk about how all of us together, you and us and others, can engage um, around specific actions and next steps at both the state and federal policy level. Now I'm going to pass it to Terry to kind of walk us through how this all works in Colorado. Um, as I'm sure many of you already know, so we're just going to do a quick overview of the state policy process because they're they're generally similar to the federal policy process, but there are some significant differences. So we're just going to run through the state policy process right now. Um, and in Colorado, we are constitutionally mandated that we have our legislative session, which just ended yesterday, 120 days into it, um, runs from January to May every year. Um, some states do it every other, every other year. Some states don't have deadlines. Colorado used to run year round, um, but they stopped that when a constitutional amendment was passed, limiting the Colorado to 120 days. So every January to May is when our legislature is in session. Um, we have a 65 member house and a 35 member Senate for a 100 member um, total legislature. Um, which, as you'll see in a bit, is vastly different from the, obviously, size of the federal legis the fed federal Congress. Um, how bill becomes a law, this is the, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. Bills get introduced. They have to go through several hearings in the House and or Senate, wherever they're introduced. Then they have to repeat the process in the other chamber. And then, depending on if, the, if, if it's the same, it then goes to the governor for a signature. If there are differences, they go to a conference committee. Bottom line is there's a lot of there's a lot of steps in the process where bills can die. Getting a bill through this process is not the easiest thing on the planet, um, and I'd say Colorado introduces anywhere from 600 to 1,000 bills a session, and probably passes I don't know four or 500 depending on how many were introduced each year. I don't have the numbers yet for this year since the session just ended last night around 10 o'clock actually. Um, so then, and it says right there, it goes to the president for signature. That is not true. It goes to the governor. 
Um, and then the, a difference that is that occurs here um, in the state that is different from the federal government is that every bill that's introduced at the, in the beginning of the legislative session or at any time in the legislative session, if it doesn't get passed that session, it dies. So every bill that didn't get passed, that was left on the calendar or died at some point in the process is dead and they have to start over again next year. Um, if, they, if someone wants to bring a bill back, we'll be talking more about that later. Um, so that's just a quick overview of the state policy process. Um, what's important to know is that's, that's a process piece of it. What's also, what's next is the um, policy and the politics part of it. Uh, this is a picture of the state capitol and it looks like the liberal crowd in front of the state capitol. Um, currently in Colorado, we have a Democratic governor, John Hickenlooper. He's been the governor for six years. Um, he will be the governor until 2020. 2018, he's up for re-election, or not re-election, he's termed out actually. So in 2018, we'll have a, it's an open seat, and actually there are a number of people who have lined up for that seat already, um, both Democrats and Republicans. Um, currently, and this will be true next year as well, we have a Democratic House um, with a nine-seat majority, which is substantially greater than it was last year. Um, the last election actually gave more seats to the Democrats in the House, and we currently have a Republican Senate with a one-seat majority. Um, again, all of that will be true again next year, um, which makes the politics in the Senate fairly interesting. Also, there's a, um, there's a fairly deep divide within the Republican Party um, that's more noticeable in the Senate, I think because they have a majority than in the House, between a very conservative coalition and then um, a more moderate group of, of Republicans. And the reason that we're talking about this is what it has done is created a um, there's a little bit of a power struggle going on in the Republican Senate um, and that creates an interesting political environment for a number of, of bills. Some big ones that happened this year having nothing to do with food policy but having to do with transportation or budget issues which are all related to everything. Um, that, that schism played out in a, in a pretty dramatic way that was ultimately resolved when the transportation bill died and the bill to save the hot to deal with the hospital provider fee having to do with the budget um, actually ended up passing but it was it was quite a power struggle to get them there um, <clears throat> the good news is having a and I think this is generally true everywhere you go but if you have a split legislature or you have a Republican governor and Democratic House and Senate or some kind of split between the parties among the three different categories you're gonna have better legislation because you have to work together. You can't then, no one party controls everything. Um, which actually, interestingly, makes it harder for the parties that are trying to control things. If, the, if one party's in control, it actually makes it harder for them. People don't believe that, but you can ask any governor that has served in that condition, and I think they would tell you that's true. But I generally think that split majority, so if you've got, in our case, a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, you end up with better legislation. Typically, um, the reason I wanted to men mention the budget uh, briefly, just because Colorado's budget is a factor in every single thing that we do here, um, because of there are three different constitutional amendments. That's its own presentation in its own right. Um, Tabor, Gallagher, and the Amendment Twenty Three, which funds K twelve education, those don't play together very nicely, and it puts severe restrictions on our budget, uh, which which is significant for trying to fund any other thing we want to try to do in this state. Um, it's an issue just about every year, and it was a pretty significant issue this year, leading, in fact, to the hospital provider fee bill. Um, if anyone has questions about the hospital provider fee bill or anything along that line, feel free to contact me at the, after the presentation, and I'll go into We don't have time to talk about that today. Um, and our contact information is at the end of the presentation. Um, also, important to note, 2018 is an election year. It is a gubernatorial election year, which means you generally get more people coming out. Um, also, it really changes the dynamic at the legislature because now you've got legislators doing everything they can that will help them get reelected. So there's less of a focus on what might be good policy and more of a focus on what's going to get me elected in my district, um, which makes the politics even more entertaining if that's the word you want to use while you're at the while you're at the legislature. So that's a little bit of the state policy environment, what it kind of looks like. Um, it was interesting this year. The election will make it even more interesting next year, so stay tuned. Thanks, Terry. 
So with that context, we would just want us to talk a little bit about what specifically LiveWell has been and will be perhaps working on um, at the state level. So many of you have probably heard about our bill. <laughs> um, so we refer to this bill, HB 1192, sort of generally as the um, COFSAC or Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council bill. Um, and, but the basics, the basics to this bill, and many of you actually were involved in this and did advocacy for us around this bill, and we thank you very much. The basic concept of this bill was to integrate um, two state two governor appointed states, basically advisory bodies, right, and task force. So the Farm to School Task Force and the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council, and integrate those two under a shared work plan and actually give them a permanent home inside the Department of Agriculture, the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And then along with that, which we thought was the most important piece, was to provide full time staffing for those entities with three primary focus areas. One staffing area would be clearly on farm to school to have a state agency position with a you know, mandated written scope of work uh, to work across the state and with national and federal partners to support farm to school in Colorado. The second key tenant there was to really support all federal food assistance programs and connecting them to Colorado agriculture. So working with programs like SNAP or formerly food stamps or WIC, um, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, other federal funded food assistance programs um, that are administered through three different state agencies outside of the Department of Agriculture and to be a liaison with those three to say really how can we build better bridges to, to make sure we're leveraging these programs and they're supporting Colorado agriculture. And then the third key tenet was um, to work with state agencies and other partners to impl implement recommendations that will be coming out of the blueprint of Colorado Food and Agriculture, which is a statewide food and ag planning process being undertaken and led by CSU and in collaboration with the Food Systems Advisory Council right now and that should be wrapping up at the end of the summer. That was the bill and Terry's gonna give you a little bit of an update now about um, what happened with that bill last week and where we go next with that. Okay, um, as this, the, our bill died um, it made it through the House of Representatives and it um, died in the first committee hearing in the Senate, although it died with a week to go in the Senate. So it got held up over in the House, um, having to do with appropriations, just making sure the appropriations clause was on there properly and, and done properly. Also, they're just have, we wait until the budget is done, then you decide whether or not you're going to fund other bills. We did get funding from the House, what they call set-aside money. So Typically at that point, if you've got your funding in the first house and it's from their set aside money, the other chamber doesn't really mess with it um, because it doesn't, it doesn't cost them anything. Um, plus this bill, as Wendy has described, it really is a win-win-win situation for everybody. It had no one opposing it. It had a number of different organizations and entities supporting it. Um, but as can happen late in a legislative session, it gets our bill got totally caught up in politics. It really had nothing to do with our bill. Um, it happens. It's unfortunate when it happens. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep my bitterness from, you know, coming through the, through the webinar at you today. But uh, we got, we ended up in the, the transportation bill and the hospital provider fee bill that I talked about earlier. There were some pretty big politics going on between the House and the Senate around that. Um, and then also there were some issues around with our sponsor, who was a Republican sponsor, he did fine, um, but he's in a swing swing district, and so he was carrying a lot of more liberal legislation, what Republicans would have considered liberal legislation, and I think some of the Republicans got tired of voting for that, and we got caught, our timing just was monumentally bad. Um, to that end, so, and if we'd been a week earlier, I think we would have been fine. Probably if we'd been two days later, I think we would have been fine. It just came down to really bad timing and getting caught up in politics that really, that absolutely had nothing to do with our bill. There is some consternation because we were putting a staff person with this at the Department of Agriculture. There was a fiscal note on our bill. It would have cost the state $100,000. Again, the House said, you can have $100,000 of our $2.5 million set aside to fund this. Um, and then the Senate was 
they were just not in the right mood the day our bill came up. So we ended up losing that one. We are, for next steps, I, we're, I think we're still fairly committed. Well, we're committed to the notion that good policy ought to trump politics, for starters. Um, so we're, we'll be looking at this issue again. We'll be meeting with all the stakeholders, the Farm to School Task Force folks, the COFSAC folks, the Department of Agriculture, um, having some internal conversations here at LiveWell. Uh, I'd be interested to know what any of you on the webinar and our other local partners think, but we'll probably be looking to run either a similar bill or the same bill um, next year. And then as we'll get into later in the webinar, talking about how we can ramp up um, relationships with legislators throughout the summer with our local partners to help promote the, the bill and its, and its, um, its positive impact that we'll have at the local level. I don't think, I think particularly in the Senate, the Senate Republicans struggled to understand why this funding this one position of the state could make a big difference for people out in the, out farmers in particular around the state. So I think we need to do a better job of explaining that. And I think we can use the summer and um, our local partners to do that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, for now, moving on to the next block there, the summer tour and the surveys, what we're, what we're hoping and planning to do in a, a survey went out earlier, I think last week, last Friday, um, asking some questions about policy and us coming around. The policy team would like to travel around the state and would like to talk to local people in their, in your towns and communities about what's going on in your world. What are you seeing? What's bothering you? We'll do a little overview about what happened at the legislature in general. Um, and then ask about what's going on in your world and what barriers you've got. Um, we'll probably also be doing some surveys later in the summer once we've completed the tour and we've got some kind of idea about what issues are out there and what's important to people. So we'd like to do a, some follow-up surveys to find out what's going on. So if any of you did not get the survey that we sent out Friday and you want, want it, please let us know through the chat box or email me at the end of the webinar and we'll send that to you. Or if you would like us to come to your community and talk about what happened at the legislature and then find out what's going on, you know, have a little bit of a listening session. Um, also let us know that. Um, the last little piece here is the other known issues that we know are out there right now. This list is obviously going to grow throughout the summer and particularly in the fall is when things really ramp up for the state legislature. But uh, Padres Unidos is currently conducting breakfast after the bell research. Um, so we're going to take a look at that. We're, they've convened a lot of partners on that and so we're part of that partnership. So we'll be taking a look at what the research says and if there are ways, you know, ways that make sense to go to improve breakfast after the bell. Um, lunch shaming, for those of you that have been reading the papers at all, this is a big thing. It's when um, kids can't, they run out of money in their food account and they're, and they don't get lunch that day. There's some schools that don't handle this well. It's a national issue. Um, we are aware that there are some schools in Colorado who don't handle this as well as they might. Um, and it, it, they do things that make these kids stand out. And so we might take a look at doing something like that with some of our partners. There has been a bill introduced at the federal level to address this issue. Um, but federal legislation tends to take a long time where state legislation can happen much faster. Um, and then the last thing is in, are issues that routinely we talk about and that keep coming up around healthy food donations and gleaning. So those are all issues that we know are out there, but we'd be interested to know your take on that. Um, so let us know if you want us to come to your community. Um, let us know if you have any thoughts on this. Obviously email and call us at any time. I'm just going to add one thing. Thanks for all of you actually watching us on Zoom. Thank you for being patient with us as we kind of go back and forth here on camera. Um, this is Wendy. Just adding one thing on the healthy food donations piece. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with the Charitable Crop Donations Act, which was initiated um, by our five food banks, Feeding Colorado and Hunger Free Colorado, several years ago. That does provide an incentive for farmers that donate their product to um, one of our five food banks or their affiliates across the state. So Live well, along with many other partners in the state have been doing, trying to examine this issue a little bit more and understand um, the incentive that we currently have. Is it motivation and is it motivation enough and who, what type of producer is it motivation for? And to kind of do some assessment around the Charitable Crop Donation Act and are now talking to several national partners as well to try to understand what are other state models that do incentivize healthy food donations, um, not just from farmers, but other retailers as well, and, and gleaning. So more to come on that as we do more research.
Okay, we're going to move on to the federal policy process now. So we've done an overview of the state, both process and a little bit of the political environment. And now we're going to overview the federal process um, and then their political environment. Um, again, the important thing is the federal process is much bigger, obviously. It's, more it's a little more complicated and complex, so things tend to take a little bit longer. Um, that's probably the single biggest difference. And then, so the congressional, congressional sessions are two-year sessions. Um, they operate on a two-year cycle, um, which coincides with the election cycle of every representative in Congress, and actually at the state level for that matter, they're elected for two years. So they're kind of constantly running for office, which also exacerbates political, the political environment. Um, senators are different. In the state, senators have four-year terms, and at the federal level, senators have six-year terms. So they actually can hunker down a little bit more and actually look at policy issues as opposed to, um, at the, as opposed to representatives who are typically always running for office. Um, so they are always kind of keeping an eye on what's going to play well in their district, um, which can be used certainly to our advantage when we want to work with them on something that's going on in our district. Um, can't see the, um, oh, yeah. So the, they are, they work, Congress works year round. Um, so again, different than the Colorado legislature, which has that four and a half month period. Congress works year round. And they do have several breaks where they're back in their districts and August is an off break for them. So typically every August, they're back in their districts. What that means for us is if we wanna meet with, if we want, if any of you or people at LiveWell want to meet with their congressional representatives and senators, the, the month of August is a good time to do it. There are other breaks. For example, the House is on a break this week. Um, so actually, Wendy and I are going to be part of a group meeting with uh, Representative Diana to get tomorrow. So you, you find the breaks and their calendars are easy to find. The, the federal calendars are easy to find. Um, there's a website that we'll talk about later that has all that information that makes it fairly easy for us. But so if you want to try to schedule time with your congressional representative, you would look for the breaks when they're back in the district. Otherwise, congressional representatives also have, Congress has a lot more money than the state legislature, so they have staff. People. They have staff people in Washington, and they have staff people back here in Colorado. Meeting with a staff person for a congressional representative or senator is almost as good as meeting with the representative or senator themselves. In some cases, it might even be better because they're actually going to, they've got more time, they're going to listen to what you say, and they're going to be the ones reading the documents you give them anyway. So cultivating a relationship with the staffs of our congressional delegate, of our federal congressional delegation is important. And, and critical for passing or for trying to influence policy at the federal level. At the state level, we don't have, they don't have staff. I mean, they, some of them who have money might pay a part-time person to do it, but it's a very different, it's a very different environment. So if you're trying to meet with your, if you're working on a state level issue, you want to meet directly with your representative or senator. If you're working on a federal level issue, then meeting with the staff person of the, of the congressperson or the senator is just, is just totally fine. Um, as you can see, you've got a 435 member House and a 100 member Senate. So we're in Colorado, we had a 100 member total House and Senate. We've got um, a 535 total member House and Senate at the federal level, so much bigger. The process is essentially the same, but with some differences. Bills are introduced, they have to go through the House, they have to go through the Senate, there are conference committees to resolve differences, and then it goes to the President for his or her signature um, if and when it, if it passes all that gauntlet. However, Bills are introduced, and then there, the, because it's so much larger, there are subcommittees. Most big, most committees then have several subcommittees, and the bills get assigned to subcommittees. It's also not uncommon to have two similar bills introduced in both houses at the same time. So one would be introduced in the House, one would be introduced in the Senate. Um, there are also companion bills that get introduced, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later as it relates to the farm bill. So, and then all of that kind of comes together at the end. So it's just it's a much more complicated. Um, system and whereas at the state level you've got pretty easy access during the session and off session to your representatives and senators it's much more challenging at the federal level to set up those kinds of meetings with your representatives and senators so it just requires a little more planning and forethought and a lot more relationship building um, at the federal level all the relationships are key all the way around also at the federal level it's typically a multi-year process it's not hugely common unless they're um, unless they're large 
big, huge political issues that a bill is going to pass on its first go around. And for a bill at the federal level, again, that's two years. You could have a bill introduced three or four times before it starts to gain traction and move somewhere. So this is something we pay attention to, like how many times has the bill been introduced? Um, if we're tracking or following bills, if it's just introduced and it's the first time, you kind of wait to see what happens and if it's going to get any traction. But it could take several cycles for that to happen. Um, and I see someone has asked a question about the slides and absolutely we'll send the PowerPoint out to everyone who is on the on the webinar today and then anyone else who might want it. Um, so we've talked about the two-year cycle and the same thing is true at the federal level that is true at the state level only it's a two-year cycle instead of a one-year cycle. And once you hit the end of that two-year cycle, all bills die. If they haven't, I don't, if you're one step away from being finished and you haven't made it by the time the the, the session ends, the two-year cycle ends, your bill dies, and you have to start all over again. Um, also, an interesting thing at the federal um, level that isn't, is true at the state level, but I think it's a much bigger player at the federal level, are um, federal agency rules and regulations. I think there's a lot more that gets done through rule and regulation at the federal level than at the state level. It happens in both places, don't get me wrong, and we spend a lot of time looking at rules and regulations at the state level, but I think the federal agencies have a lot more latitude. Again, it's just they're a lot bigger. Congress doesn't have time to work out details on things, and so they leave a lot of the details to the agencies. Whereas in Colorado, you might have more details worked out in a piece of legislation rather than relying on an agency. Um, so a lot of politics happens around rules and regulations at the agency level. So that is the federal policy process. Um, okay. Have to hit on the slide. There, there we go. go. Um, so the federal policy environment, <laughs> for anybody who's living in this country right now probably knows, the politics are stratospherically weird. Um, we have a new administration. President Trump is an unconventional president, I think it's safe to say. And <clears throat> so that has created a, a very different environment in Washington. Um, we're not going to get into that because that in and of itself would be an, its own presentation. Um, but we did recently get the Agriculture Secretary confirmed. He was one of the last cabinet appointees to be confirmed. It's Sonny Perdue. He's out of Georgia. On the relative scale of appointments, I think while um, Sonny Perdue makes some people nervous because it comes from a very commodities-based background, um, less fruits and vegetables, he's, um, he at least comes from a background with some agriculture. Um, he's also politically savvy, having been the governor of Georgia. So, and he hasn't done, he's doing, he's moving things forward in a direction that, you know, it's tend to make sense for agriculture. I mean, let's, it's a, with a conservative bent. I mean, it's the Republicans won the, they won the election, so they get to populate the, the cabinet. And so there's gonna be more of a conservative bent, just as if when um, President Obama was president, he populated with a more liberal um, bent. That's the way politics works. But he is moving quickly to um, fill out his, his staff at the department, and they just issued a list of people who, you know, who are gonna help him with this. And so, <clears throat> And he's talking about, um, he's put, he is actually putting in an undersecretary for trade, which is something that people have wanted at Ag for a long time to work for farmers in particular, um, and how that relates to NAFTA, which is certainly an issue right now. Trade is an issue with President Trump's stated positions on trade, create problems for farmers. And so th that ought to be an interesting political dy dynamic. So there's just... There's a whole lot up in the air politically going on right now in DC. Um, so everyone's just kind of moving through <clears throat> in the in the way they know, meeting new people and moving forward. So, and I think Megan can talk a little bit more about that kind of environment since she's actually in Washington, DC. Um, the Republican Senate, much like uh, the Repu now to my previous comments in Washington, it is controlled by one party right now. We have a Republican president, we have a Republican majority Senate, and we have a House Republican majority. But the Senate majority is a slim margin. It's a four seat majority. Um, and typically because of the way their rules work, they have to have 60 votes to pass anything. So um, unless they decide to undo that as well. But right now they have to have 60 votes to get certainly anything contentious through. Um, so they don't have their, they ha it has to be a bipartisan compromise to do that. So right now the Senate is kind of holding the line of the stuff that happens in the House, which is true in any kind of 
situation like that. Anytime you have one party controlling something, you get, you can get some pretty crazy legislation, and then you have to look to look to where you, your choke points are. And in this case, the Senate looks like the congressional choke point for legislation. Um, the budget, there was a huge hue and cry about the budget when the president released his, he called it a skinny budget. It was basically an outline. Um, it was looking to cut pretty much everything on the planet, I think, um, except for military spending. There was a lot of angst and agony over that that ended up being, at this point, much ado about nothing as Congress, Congress was close to a bipartisan compromise on a budget. And then they started talking about building the wall and wanting to do that. The president backed off of that. And so essentially we have more or less a continuing budget for 2017. It didn't change anything too drastically um, that is good through the end of 2017. Although our partners at the National Sustainable Agricultural um, Coalition are telling us that the 2018 budget will be a much different, it'll, it, uh, it's going to be a much different fight. Um, so we need to be keeping our eyes on that because there are several provisions within the within the federal budget that greatly will impact the work that we do here in the state level. So that's something we're going to be definitely paying attention to. Also, again, the upcoming 2018 election is going to be certainly getting more and moment, more and more momentous by the day. I think um, typically in off year elections, right after so two years after a president is elected, the 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 other party, the minority party, will gain seats. In this case, that'd be the Democrat. The demographics in the Senate aren't good. The Democrats are defending a lot of seats. The Republicans aren't defending many seats. But if things keep going the way they are politically, I don't, I would think the Senate majority could be in trouble. The House Republican majority is, I think people are thinking it is in trouble right now. We're a long way out from the election, but um, if things keep going the way they are. It's not out of the realm of possibility that that would flip to Democratic control because there's usually a pretty big gain. And I, the, Cook, the Cook political report just put up um, 20 seats as toss ups right now. And you need 24. They need tw the Democrats need 24 seats to take control of the House. And Cook political report currently has, which is a nice, they're actually a good site to look at. It's very um, neutral good information. Uh, they have put 20 seats in the toss-up column. So to move on quickly, I, we've listed here our House and Senate delegations. Um, the one note in the House is uh, Senator Perlmutter is actually going to be stepping down. He'll be running for the governor of the state of Colorado um, in 2018. So he will not be there and his seat is open and people are lining up for that seat as well. It's the most competitive district in Colorado. Um, which is Congressional District 7. So that'll be interesting to keep an eye on. And then in the Senate of note, Senator Bennett is on the Agriculture Committee, which is going to matter greatly to us as we move forward on the Farm Bill. Wendy's going to talk about that in a little bit. And then Senator Cory Gardner is, it's the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Basically what that is, is he's heading up the effort to at least hold the line and keep a Republican majority in the Senate, if not increase it. Um, it's a leadership role. So he's actually moving pretty far, pretty fast in the realm of Washington politics into leadership roles. He's also on the committee that's going to draft the Senate version of the Affordable Health Care Act. So he's being tapped for a lot of leadership things, which is um, good for Colorado as long as we can educate him on issues that are important to us. So that is the story there. Thanks, Terry. This is Wendy again. So now we want to move into a little bit more specificity around issues that we here at LiveWell are either actively engaging in or tracking to some degree or working on collaborating with other partners. Um, of course, this is all to say we are one of many partners here in the state of Colorado. There are many other issues that you all and others are working on that are of equal importance. Uh, many other issues that we actually probably even support. Um, but we're just going to share a few things that, that we at LiveWell have been prioritizing um, currently. So uh, Terry just mentioned too or that we work with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. This is an important partnership for us to mention. We, LiveWell Colorado is um, a member, a dues being member of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. At this point we're the only actual member from the state of Colorado although they do partner with other organizations across the country. Um, they are and have been for a very long time very active at the federal level um, in working on the Farm Bill. I think if we think a lot of sort of the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food suite of programs, um, 
a lot of those really came out of advocacy from the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Um, and it's been incredibly beneficial for us at LiveWell to have a federal partner based in DC um, really leading some of these efforts with which we can provide some feedback and some information and we really gain from their platform as they develop it as well. So the bulk of our work with NSAC right now has been on developing what they call a marker bill, uh, sort of an intro bill. It's basically conceptual, it's very detailed, um, but it is not expected to be written into the Farm Bill as it is. It's a way for um, sponsors of sort of this marker bill and NSAC members to put forward what are our primary um, areas of focus and concern and interest and priority, um, being full well aware that this won't be written as is in the eventual farm bill that gets adopted, but it's our, we're kind of putting our stake in the ground around certain issues. So it's a local foods, it's the local food marker bill as it's been talking about that NSAC has been working on and that we've been providing feedback to. Um, there's three core um, priority areas for that marker bill, um, and these three are exactly why we're very supportive of it. And that is one, to expand opportunities for family farmers and food entrepreneurs. Two, to increase access to fresh, healthy local foods to rural and urban communities. And three, to develop new and strengthen existing infrastructure that connects producers to consumers. And again, this bill has not gone public in any way yet. Um, we expect that to happen in the next couple of months, but we will continue to work with them. Um, and we will work with them on sort of overall engagement. We'll talk more at the end of the webinar about um, what we're doing around engagement, how we want to work with you all around engagement. But just so you know, given our um, status, I think, of having an Ag Committee member and Senator Bennett, it will be really uh, helpful for us. We bring a lot of value, I think, to the table, and that we can work with you all and other partners across the state to be that voice to Senator Bennett on the Ag Committee about why these concepts that are in the Local Food Systems Bill are so important to Colorado. So we'll continue to work with you all and with NSAC to document the impact that um, local food systems, regional food systems, healthy food access programs have had in Colorado and specifically document grants that we've received, programs that have happened in Colorado, um, the benefits we've all received because of those and really help tell that story um, to help move that specific marker bill forward. Other issues, that these are just examples of the types of issues that we have been and will continue to track and there will be many others. Uh, just as an example, there has been some conversation uh, with partners across the country about um, how we really kind of expand the definition basically of farmers markets. So some of you are probably aware that right now, EBT technology, so it's, that's the technology needed to swipe uh, your EBT card, which you use for SNAP, formerly food stamps, and now for WIC. Um, and there's been conversation, and that technology right now, through some federal funds and state funds, has been available for free. Um, no, no cost technology to farmers markets or direct market farming operations or farms. So that's an example of we have been a part of conversations saying how can we expand that definition a little bit so that if you are a retailer of many different types, right, you can look a lot of different ways and still be selling Colorado grown produce and we think you should be available to have this technology for free. There's just a lot more new um, flexibility and innovation in how um, retail settings, direct market operations are, are serving communities, specifically low-income communities, and we want to see them all have this technology. The other issue that Terry just mentioned is um, there's two urban agriculture bills. They've not been introduced yet. They've been drafted, led by Senator Stabenow um, out of Michigan and Representative Kaptur out of Ohio. They're two different bills, yet related. Um, Generally, we're very supportive of these bills. As Terry mentioned, we'll be with other partners tomorrow morning, just doing a roundtable with Congresswoman DeGetz out of Denver. Um, with her office tomorrow, she's looking to co-sponsor Senator Stabenow's Urban Ag Bill. Um, and we'll continue again to track this progress once it gets introduced. Um, that bill specifically has a lot of um, vision to it to create an actual urban agriculture uh, position in the USDA and really leverage USDA's, you know, whether it's lending, research, finance, um, cooperative development, really how do you m m leverage all of those existing federal resources and to support more urban agriculture production and production to markets in urban areas. And the last one is the Farm to School Act. 
Um, just as an example, this is something that sits in the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act. There have been some talk back and forth since CNR is not moving forward. Hey, is that something we could also address or promote in the farm bill, at least conceptually? Right now, it sounds like that is not really a good plan, but it is something that we are highly supportive of. It's expanding a previous act, um, a $5 million funding for farm to school, increasing it to $10 million, um, and expanding resources around farm to school. So just an example of other federal issues that we will continue to track and support and communicate on. So then specifically our farm bill platform, which is still, we're keeping this at a very high level right now. So what I want you to take from this slide um, is that is, is, is nothing. No, we don't want you to take anything too seriously as set in stone from this slide. And how we're going to approach our farm bill platform is that we need to be clear about what our key sort of tenants are to this. But specifically within those, things are going to change, right? We don't even have a farm bill to react to yet. We don't, we don't fully grasp the full federal environment and how things are going to change if we get a farm bill in 2018. But what we do know is that there's three things that we want to focus on. One is the structural integrity of SNAP. So it's really maintain SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly Food Stamps, is that LIBO will continue to support any, in, any possible measure to maintain the structural integrity of that program. And that could end up looking a lot of different ways. Um, but the, the basic there for SNAP is that there's, there's been chatter and there will continue to be chatter about, do we block grant this program? Do we make it a block grant to states to administer, right? Or do we completely sever SNAP from the farm bill? It makes it like 80% of the farm bill right now. Do we separate that from all the agricultural work, which um, we believe, and many of our partners believe, would actually be very damaging um, and politically very divisive. We have also heard that those things are probably not very likely. Those aren't our biggest concerns right now. We are more concerned about other ways that um, the federal government and legislators can really tweak SNAP in ways that we think would restrict eligibility, right? Restrict making restrictions, for example, on, you know, able-bodied adult workers, right? And who is eligible or not. So those are the kind of things we want to track. We want to see support for SNAP and employment and training, support for SNAP education. We don't want to see anything that would restrict eligibility. Um, and we know that we're this conversation about purchase SNAP purchasing limits, like uh, SNAP dollars, can they be spent on, what kind of foods can they be spent on? There's going to continue to be chatter around these, and we want to be in a position to respond to all of those. So that's sort of number one, just maintaining structural integrity of SNAP. Then the second big bucket of our Farm Bill platform is really around uh, healthy food incentives. So as many of you probably know, Live Well, along with many, many other partners across the state, received a FINI grant, a Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program grant. That was a grant that came with five years of mandatory funding out of the last Farm Bill, the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, but it is not a permanent program. It, it was then at that point written to sort of survive one cycle of the Farm Bill. Um, as a Finney grantee and as a uh, huge devoted fan of Double Up Food Bucks Colorado, the program we administer with that grant, it is absolutely a priority of ours to work with state and national partners to make sure that that becomes a permanent um, and sustainable program out of the USDA. The third big bucket is a very, very broad bucket um, that generally we want to look across every title of the Farm Bill and we want to see support for um, programs and funding for community food systems in low-income communities and communities of color. And these type of programs don't just sit in the nutrition title where SNAP sits. These are programs that sit across lots of titles in the Farm Bill. So we'll be tracking things like support for what's called the Socially Disadvantaged Farmer and Rancher Program um, and seeing increased support for programs like that that really remove barriers um, for socially disadvantaged farmers or for beginning or returning farmers and ranchers to keep on or enter into farming and production. Um, if there's efforts around healthy food financing, which provides net federal financing for healthy retail um, at the local and state level, we would like to support the expansion of that program. So there's just some examples of here that wherever it sits, that there are programs we feel like are directing our resources, specifically in low-income communities and communities of color, that's exactly where we will lend our support. So that's where we sit on the Farm Bill. And I'm going to pass it back to Terry to talk about school nutrition. Right. Um, and before I, just a quick note, before I get started on that, just a quick note on the politics, because Wendy does the policy and I do the politics. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so 
on the politics around the our our platform there there was a bullet point around um, Finney with having to do with preventing other industries from taking part of Finney. Um, we have there was the dairy industry had testified in front of um, the Senate Agri Senate Agriculture one of the Agriculture Committees that they wanted to be included in in um, Finney. Now I don't saying nothing about dairy. Finney was specifically designed around fruits and vegetables and the promotion of fruits and vegetables and um, increasing access to fresh, healthy, uh, nutritious foods. So since there's a finite amount there and it is a discretionary funded program, I, we think that it ought to stay focused on fruits and vegetables. And so we will be working with partners to resist that the incursion of dairy or other other industries that don't make any sense in Finney. There may be other places where it makes sense for dairy to get incentive funding, or they can create their own incentive funding program, whatever um, they want to do, but th we just firmly believe that they don't belong in Finney. Um, also, the reason the Wendy snap block, block granting is a big deal at the federal level under um, Republican control. They like to block grant things to the state. The reason we don't think that is going to be an issue this time is because commodity prices are low and farmers are hurting across color, or across the country. And so the chair of House Ag has gone to Speaker Ryan and said, we can't mess around with SNAP. It'll, we need to pass this thing when, it's, when it expires in September of 2018. So we can't mess around with this. We, if we start screwing around with SNAP, we're going to end up um, way past 2018 and our farmers will suffer more. So that's the general feeling with our partners in Washington um, and our lobbying team about why they think block granting and taking SNAP out of the farm bill aren't really going to be part of the conversation. People, as Wendy said, people will bring them up. There will be chatter about it, but nobody really thinks it's going to get much traction this year um, for those reasons. So that's why we're you know moving on to other things. So again, we'll be paying attention to all of the farm bills that comes through and our platform will evolve as issues arise that we feel need to be addressed or, 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 or are important or if we hear from you all about what's going on and there are things that we need to be need to be taking a look at. So um, school nutrition, this is um, part of this we're just now rolling out. You get the first preview look because um, it's in draft form and you'll notice the nutrition platform it says draft right after that. Um, but we are working on an official uh, platform on school nutrition. Um, and this is the first preview of that. But before we do that, Whitney touched on this, the child nutrition reauthorization, that that has expired. Now, at the federal level, again, this is different than the state level. At the federal level, it'll just keep rolling along. Anything that's not discretionary, anything they agreed to fund before that's not discretionary, just keeps rolling along. Um, there are a lot of people in this field that think, frankly, with the political environment as it is in D.C. right now, that leaving child nutrition alone makes the reauthorization just make sense and it'll keep rolling along the way it has, and we can then look to address it when things have calmed down or evened out in DC. Plus which, Congress doesn't have time for this. They're trying to do the Affordable Care Act, they're trying to do tax reform, they're trying to do a, a infrastructure plan. Right now, they need a new FBI director. So they're in a bit of chaos there in DC right now, so something like child nutrition reauthorization, there's no way it'll even come up in the next two years. The follow-on two years, maybe. I mean, we'll wait and see what happens. We are keeping track of that, and there are a coalition of, of organizations in Colorado that um, are very interested and pay attention to that. Um, just to preview our school nutrition platform, um, this is coming up recently because the Department of Ag under Sonny Perdue, one of the first things he did was to issue a bit of a rollback to nutritional standards that had been implemented under the Obama administration. This is part of Michelle Obama's um, initiative. And we do have a statement opposing the rollback. Um, our focus is mostly on the inclusion of 1% flavored milk. Uh, and that I think is available on our website. If anybody wants to, if anybody wants to see it, um, we can get it to you. It will be available on our website. It is our official statement on, on this um, action by the USDA. And out of that, we determined we really need a platform on school nutrition. And broadly, what it looks like is that we support the National School Lunch Program and the use of whole fresh ingredients for scratch cooking. Um, if you do that, that takes care of most of the nutritional needs that kids require. 
Um, we promote minimal, minimally or unprocessed foods over highly processed foods. And we promote water as the preferred beverage option. And we would like to eliminate all sugar sweetened beverages, including flavored milk, um, in school meals. So that's our general platform around school nutrition. There's some politically contentious issues in there. Um, but we feel that this is a good place to for live well to to be so that once we get that drafted that will also be on our website um, and I'd be happy for anyone to provide us any feedback on any of that um, as we move forward even once it's drafted and on the website I would be interested to know what um, you all think so this is just we're going to run through this slide very quickly. Um, we're not even going to go through all the bills. This is just to let you know, we are, these are bills we're tracking. Um, it's, not a comp it's not the full list, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of things that we look to support and the kinds of things we look to oppose. Later on in the presentation, again, there's a website where both you can track these kinds of things or you can look them up and see what they're about. If you have questions about any of them or our positions on them, again, I would be happy to uh, talk to anybody about that. But these just give you an idea of what's out there um, and the kinds of things that we take a look at and where we land on our positions. Um, I will say the 1064, Senville 1064 in the support column, that is the brand new um, lunch shaming bill that just was introduced. And right underneath that is the Agricultural Worker Program Act that um, Senator Bennett and five others, four others have, are introducing. So these are all things, and it's basically a it's for agricultural workers to be able to come into and out of the country with ease and also provides a path to citizenship. So that is, that's, this just gives you an overview of what we look at at the federal level. Um, also, if there is, these are in our policy update that we send out twice a month. Um, if there's a bill that you know about that you want to keep track of, let us know. We'll add it to our policy update and you can track it through there. And again, I'm going to talk about a website a little bit later on where you can track these kinds of things. Great. Thanks, Terry. So I'm actually going to quickly pass it over to Megan here, but just one thing to, to note if we did at the beginning is that Terry and I are pretty smart people, but we're not all knowing. We are not coming up with all of this ourselves or tracking all this ourselves. It is important to know that we do have federal lobbyists that we work with. We work with Squire Patton Boggs. We have the Mond Retainer. They are based in D.C. and, in, and here in Denver. Um, so we have sort of a full team that we can work with and then also, you know, activate as needed around these issues. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Megan Lovely. She's joining us from D.C. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she's doing a policy internship with National Farmers Union in D.C. for a few months right now. She is, as many of you probably know, um, just a, a strong policy advocate um, on issues across Colorado and the nation. Um, she is a Western Slope producer representative seat on the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council. She and her work has started a four-acre farm um, in Eagle County that serves their local food bank and nutrition education there. Um, and she's now, I did not know this, just now working on a film um, on the importance of keeping farmers on the land and the farm. So we're going to pass it over to Megan to hear about her experience and some of her takeaways. Hi. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit today in regards to what the policy environment looks like here in um, Washington, D.C., um, having worked um, extensively in, um, in Colorado, it's a little different. So um, I'll start with some of those differences. Um, so you've kind of heard sessions move differently um, and how some of the legislative processes work a little bit differently. Um, and I think that any of you who've worked in policy know that um, in Colorado, it's pretty quick. Uh, you meet with your representatives, get some ideas together, session starts, and, and you work fast. Uh, so um, here in DC, I think that um, with the current administration, it's important to understand that with all the moving pieces, it's great to just do your research. So um, that's been a big learning experience for me here. Um, and uh, so the things to know for advocating right away, right? Uh, know your story and what is your 30 second um, elevator speech. What's your two-minute elevator speech? How are you communicating to that legislator, to that representative? Uh, what's important about 
why um, the bill they're carrying or why this issue is important. Uh, know your statistics. If you've got two minutes, spend half of it on um, knowing the statistics and half of it on sharing your story. It's pretty um, impactful to hear the stories of the different community members from across um, the state and even if you're not their constituents. If you can plug your story into why that legislation works or doesn't work for people across the United States, then you have, you've touched that legislator and they'll, they will take that back with them but also understand that it needs to come with statistics. Uh, so what I like to do is go in, start with a couple statistics, tell my story, and then go back to the statistics with an ask. Um, and so tell them what you're gonna tell them. Hello, my name is Megan Lovelace, and I'm here to talk to you about why school nutrition programs are so important across the United States. And then tell them what you're gonna tell them. So one in four children is relying on the free and reduced lunch program for healthy, nutritious food. And that's every day they go to school without having the nutrition standards, they're not getting the nutrition they need, leading to long-term health benefits that they won't have without the nutrition standards. And then tell them again, it's important, I'm a mother, I'm a farmer, and I believe in these programs. We need you to believe in them too. Um, and uh, Terry mentioned the, uh, the aides, and those are key. Oftentimes you don't really meet with the legislator, you meet with their aides. Understand how valuable those individuals are. And while I might be in the district meeting with aides on the Hill, um, they have offices in your state. So they've got offices in Colorado and you can meet with the legislative aides there in those offices. I feel like going to their office and meeting directly with them, if that is, is something you can do, bring a parent, bring a farmer, bring a person that is affected by that issue um, and bring literature. Uh, you can get a lot of that literature from the, uh, directly from Live Well, they're great. In fact, oftentimes when I mean literature, statistics, I call Wendy and say, give me, give me what you got. Um, and uh, it's something you can leave with them. It's something for them to think about. So you're not just leaving them with your story. You're leaving them with the story that, uh, that helps to frame why, why this issue is important, why these two minutes uh, change the way that you think about that policy. Um, Other thing that I would let you know, uh, make sure that you're researching these legislatures. So how have they voted in the past? Um, what did they vote on? What are the issues that are really important to them? While I'm here in DC going to the committee hearings, and there's been several on the farm uh, bill, and uh, you can actually just watch those. Uh, there's a website, I think um, Terry will have the link for you, and you can um, go online and watch the hearings. It's really insightful as to understanding which legislators on the agriculture committees are asking the different questions. What do they know? What don't they know? Who is sitting in those hearings? Who is, uh, who's representing you? If you're a parent with children in the school system and, and free and reduced lunch is important to you, if you're a farmer looking to get on land and land access is important to you, who's sitting in those hearings representing your voice? And what did they say to those legislators? Was your voice represented? Um, and who out of those legislators asked the questions that you thought, I have that answer? I can, I have a, the story for you. I can tell you about the family in Kansas that was devastated by the, um, the frost and they lost their winter wheat. Or I could tell you about the mother who relies on the summer food service program to feed her children. And that mother's me, right? Um, so, uh, so identify those legislators. Those are the ones that they need to hear your story. Um, and that affects how the movement um, happens here in the district. I feel like also alliances and partnerships, while uh, many of you may have noticed in Colorado, everyone is very, very willing to work together towards the common goal um, because session is so fast. Uh, we all have our heads down, we're all in the work. Um, 
oftentimes being very strategic about how those alliances are formed at the federal level looks really different. I think having the National Sustainable Ag Coalition as a partner is amazing. Um, Farmers Union uh, is such an incredible resource. So understanding how you make those alliances. Um, I find that I spend a lot more time listening and uh, seeing the spaces in between the conversations. And a lot of times that's where the movement happens. So um, being mobilized, being ready with the research, with the story, and with the statistics. Uh, you never know when they're going to press go on something, especially right now. <laughs> um, so I think knowing that you're ready when they do press go um, with the story that matters. And uh, some legislator is really going to embrace you, and so will their staff. And some won't. Some will hand you back your literature and tell you that their boss has already decided that this is a non-issue for them, uh, as you would with anybody that you're trying to form an alliance with. You will uh, meet them with grace and uh, compassion, and be kind, and um, and say thank you. And even if they've handed back the literature, you have made your impact. So know that too, that sometimes the no is really a yes. In a place like this, you just won't ever hear the yes. So don't give up um, and keep plugging away at the story that is important for not just you, but for your community and remind that representative that you're speaking on behalf of, if you're a farmer, every farmer in the United States or every parent in the United States, every, every mother who, who has to find a way to feed her family every day, every commissioner that has to figure out how planning works with the city growing faster than it knows how to, how to structure it so that it works for everyone. We're all in this fight together. So um, just remember that when when something like the health care bill happens. <laughs> um, and uh, stick with your story, because that's what's really important. Thank you so much, Megan, for sharing your story with us. Um, and at the end of this, by the way, we will share all of our contact information, including Megan's. Um, so you can hound her all you want with all of your questions. And for the meantime, keep chatting in questions if you have them. Um, thanks, Megan. That was great. It's always good to get the firsthand version of what that's like. Um, now we're going to, building off what Megan has just talked about, we're going to talk about how we can all work together, live well, local partners, you locally, in your community, and your partners that you cultivate to affect political change. Um, the first thing is uh, information sharing. We're going to start with information sharing. I've talked about our summer policy tour. Again, if you have an interest in that, please email me um, or type it into the chat box. If and we'll be we'll be going around this summer meeting with folks in communities to talk about what's going on there. Um, we are forming topical policy committees at Livewell Colorado. We're going to have three topical policy committees. One will be community food access, one will be school food, and one will be active transportation, um, transit, active living, that kind of thing. So we're going to try that and see if we uh, can't get engagement around those issues. We tried a broad policy committee that didn't work very well because too many, the issues are too disparate. So we're breaking it up into smaller policy committees and uh, we're going to give that a try. Um, the Colorado Food Policy Network and the work groups that they have, that's also an excellent place for information sharing. There are 16-ish, 18-ish local food policy networks. If you're working in food policy and you want to find out about a food policy network in your area and you don't know, contact Wendy. Um, she'd be happy to hook you up. If you're in an area where there isn't a food policy network, contact Wendy. She'd be happy to help you figure out how to develop one. Um, Live Well hosts the Colorado Food Systems Digital Hub, which is an excellent resource, both for get, getting the data that Megan talked about, um, finding out, you know, mapping things in your community, and sharing information with other people about what you can find out what they're doing, you can share what you're doing. Um, HEAL Network meetings, those are happening twice a year. We do a post-legislative 
here's what happened, and then we'll do a pre-legislative, here's what's going on. Um, that All that information will be emailed out through all of our various networks and will also be on our website when they're scheduled. And then in uh, November, actually, I think this year, will be the HEAL Summit. Uh, we're combining that with the food policy convening this year. So um, I think that's going to be up here in Denver. And we look forward to seeing you all at that. So that's those are all opportunities for information sharing. Also, if there are events going on in your community that you think it would be beneficial for us to be at, let us know. We like to travel. We like to see what goes on around the state. So if you've got something going on in your community and you think that would be it would be useful for us to be there to hear what's going on, please let us know. Um, then we're moving on to to the capacity building. It's this is true for community within your community. It's true for with building capacity up, upward with your state legislature. It's true for working at the federal level. It is all about the relationships. I think Megan very eloquently talked about how you have to go to things, you listen to things, you talk to people, you learn what's happening, and then you you know figure out where you are and make your pitch. But you have to develop the relationships. That's true for anything, um, anything in policy. I think it's important to develop local networks and coalitions around your specific issues. This is true if you want to work at the local level, at the state level, or at the federal level. If you have, the more, the merrier. The more people you have on board what you're trying to do when you start out, the, the easier it is to do it. Um, the more force you bring when you're talking to elected officials, whether it's your city councilman, your state legislator, or your federal congressman. If you can say these 10 organizations in this region support what we're doing, that matters. And so you want to develop your local networks. Um, you want to invite your legislators, your congresspersons to your sites to, to show them what you're doing to your events. I can, I can tell you that I have been to a number of days at the Capitol, legislative updates, attended webinars like this, and every single person, whether it's at the federal or state level, will say, invite your legislator, invite your congressman, invite your city council person out to your site, to your events, and everybody goes, okay, and then nobody does it. So recognizing that, um, we are going to, and it's coming up here, in the, I think, on the next slide, we're going to work on an engagement strategy where we work with our, with our local partners to do just that. It, when, when we say that it matters, it actually does matter. It's not just something we're saying. It actually is the thing that makes the biggest difference. If a legislator or congressperson goes to your farm, and sees what's happening and sees the fruits and vegetables growing and listens to you talk about how you're donating them to the local food pantry or you're working with your school on the farm to school or whatever it is that you're doing. If, you, if they see the kitchen that you're cooking your, you know, your meals for, from scratch at for your lunch program, for your school, whatever it is, it makes an impression on them that no piece of paper will ever make. You can hand them a piece of paper, you can talk about the things, you can tell them, you can give them statistics, you can talk about this, that's all good stuff, don't get me wrong. That's all good stuff, but nothing will make an impression like, on them like being out at your farm or being in your school having school lunch or anything along that. The, the meeting we're having tomorrow is at, with the Congresswoman to get is at Grow House because that, makes a, that, that will make a much bigger impression on her than sitting in an office somewhere. So I can't stress enough how important this is. I get it can be intimidating and uncomfortable if you're not used to working with people. That's why we're here to help. Um, the other thing you can do is every legislator and congressperson is going to have town halls, listening sessions, um, coffees, meetings, whatever it is. I think right now Senator Gardner is limiting himself to telephone town halls, but I, um, Senator Bennett has been out doing listening sessions. Last time he was in town, he squeezed a bunch of them in over, over um, a, a couple of weeks. Go. Make the time and go. Introduce yourself. Get to know them. Get to know their staff. That way when you call with an issue or you email with an issue, they, they can connect it to a face and a, and a place. It matters. Um, don't be intimidated. They're, they're not actually intimidating. Um, they're just human people like they're, well, most of them are human people like the rest of us. So I think it's, I, I just, I think this is, we talk about it a lot. It doesn't happen much, um, but the dividends that it would pay for you and whatever your issues are, and then whatever coalitions you're working in would be tremendous if, if we did this. So to that end, I'm going to skip back and forth because I did these in the wrong order. Um, 
the what we are planning on doing is we're going to try to work with our local partners to engage their state legislators and their congresspersons for three reasons the farm bill um, our bill the live well Colorado bill the one that died um, the dead bill and then also for whatever issues that you've got going on in your area I mean this isn't a one-way thing you if you've got the ear of your congressperson or your state legislator tell them whatever it is you want to talk about um, this you're, you're not limited there you're not constrained you do as Megan said you want to have your story you need to know what it is you're talking about and you need to have it together rambling isn't going to help so you need to be very on point with whatever it is your whatever it is you want to say but once you're once you have that and then you're meeting with them that can, you can meet with them about whatever it is that you want to meet with them about um, so to this end we're gonna work with our local partners to engage their state legislators around the liberal Colorado bill and the con and your congresspersons around the farm bill um, because again as I said they actually want to see you in action they you're they represent you and actually most of them take that very seriously it doesn't seem like it when they're in DC and all the crap is going on or maybe even at the state legislature during the session but they really do they represent you and they want to know what you think that's why they're there that's why they're doing what they're doing for the most part um, so what we're going to do is we'll provide our platforms on these issues platform on the farm bill platforms on our state bill once we have that crafted again again we have to do some work with our partners to figure out where we're going with that um, we will help provide data um, as Megan said if you can start with data it matters um, it really matters if they're standing on your farm while you're talking about it um, we will do sign-on letters this is probably more for the farm bill than anything else but we'll create a sign-on letter that you and your community partners could sign on if you want to um, which again it just says in numbers here's what's important to Colorado please pay attention to this and then we will help you in any way you need if you want to if you want to do this but you're not sure how to do it call us we'll help you we'll join you if you want us to we'll come with you um, to do it if that if that makes it easy or is, or is, is somehow makes it better um, or whatever help you might think you need we're happy to help you do that um, we are happy to have anybody do this the more the merrier as I said um, we will also be recruiting people for specific targets one of the things about lobbying issues or addressing issues is finding out who your targets are this will be particularly true for our state legislative um, effort we know which Republicans in the Senate we're going to need to target if we want to get it passed so we might be reaching out to you specifically to do that that doesn't mean that we don't want you to not do it if you're not if we're not individually contacting you um, we would love to know who is doing it so if you wanted to let us know we would appreciate um, a phone call on that and again we're happy to help in any any way this summer for the state legislators is obviously the time to do it they just finished the session so give them a couple weeks to decompress and then any time after that through I would say September ish um, is a good time to try to meet with them in their district Congress again that's year-round and we'll be working with um, their staffs their local staff people in addition to trying to find them when they're in town like August is a good time to get them um, and for starters for those of you who are interested um, just to get your dip your toe in what we heard from NSAC uh, just yesterday I believe two days ago whenever it was is that um, what would be helpful to them on the farm bill and obviously then helpful to us and helpful to you would be to map the assets in your community what's what's currently happening in your community around food that's related to the farm bill what federal rural development grants exist what other grants exist from the federal from USDA that are already in your community what's happening in that community um, that way NSAC will be able to present again Senator Bennett is on the Agriculture Committee we are in Colorado so they will be wanting from us information about what's going on in the state of Colorado already what federal money is in the state so we can say to Senator Bennett it's important that you protect this particular program because X number of counties in Colorado are utilizing these funds and it's doing this many things so for those of you that are interested in giving it a try um, see if you can find out what those assets are in your community if you don't know where to start call us we'll help you um, we'll help you figure out how to go about it 
Um, but that would be helpful for Senator Bennett when he's fighting for programs that are important to us here in Colorado. Is there anything you want to add to that before I go back to the other slide? The one quick thing I'll add is that uh, check your inbox. You all get lots of emails from me. Um, but somewhat of all, we will be following up with you specifically to document what Terry was just talking about, is that um, there is a, this thing called the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass, which tries to track all these federal programs we have in Colorado, like who's received the you know, value-added producer grant, who's received the Finney grant, you know, what resources have come in. We know it's not fully comprehensive, so we are going to be surveying a lot of you to say, hey, what projects are not captured in this compass? So we can really document to Senator Bennett primarily, but others, look at all the resources and programming that we have had in care in Colorado, and then look at, obviously, the benefits there. Thanks. And then just lastly, as I've been promising throughout, these are, here are ways to, to learn about what's going on, to stay updated, and to track things that are important to you. We, at LiveWell, we produce, as I mentioned, the policy updates. We, we do one standalone issue once a month, and then as part of LiveWell Colorado's e-newsletter, there's a policy update portion of that e-newsletter that comes out up in between the policy updates. So, and that's updated to be current. So that's one way to stay webinars, like this one. Um, and then social media. We're much more aggressively in social media than we have been in the past. So our Facebook and our Twitter feeds in particular are carrying a lot more information, I think, than they used to. Um, so you might want to check in on those. And then I've got four websites here. One is one thing people don't always know who their legislator is. There are a number of ways you can find that out. Um, and if you're just looking for your state legislator, the Colorado General Assembly webpage is a good place to do that. But I did, I was checking this out a couple days ago trying to find a good site and I have, this is Common Causes site. If you type in your address, you'll get everyone who represents you from the president on down. So it's kind of one-stop shopping is why I landed on this website. Um, I thought it was the, mo the easiest to use, frankly. So that's one place where it's just one-stop shopping. You can get who your congressperson is, you can get who your senators are, you can find out who your state reps and state senator is. Um, again, as with anything, if you have trouble with any of this, contact us, we're happy to help out. Um, the second website there is the General Assembly, Colorado General Assembly website. This is actually a very good website where you can, during the session, watch and listen to hearings. As Megan was talking about the federal level, we have that at the state level, and it's through this website here. You also have, um, you can look back, I think to 1992 or something for bills that are have been enacted. You can see what happened this this just this past session. If it's during the session, you can see what's going on. You can look up specific bills, find out what people voted on them. All of that information is there at that website. Um, the next website is the congressional website, congress.gov. That's the one I think Megan was talking about. You can track just about anything out of there, and I that's where you can watch the hearings that are going on. It's vast. There's a lot going on there, but I found it I find it fairly easy to use and to find the hearings, and I mean, they make it fairly user-friendly. Um, to find the hearings, it is interesting to watch the hearings. They also archive everything, and it's right there. So if you want to, if you miss something, like there was a SNAP hearing about a month ago, I missed it. It was very easy to find, to find it in their archives, and so I could watch the whole thing anyway. Um, and then I found this other website, it's govtrack.us. This is the site I use to track the federal bills. Um, you can, it'll send me email updates when something has been introduced into the Agriculture Committee. You can set it, the parameters however you want it, I mean, anything you're interested in. Um, and then you can also say, I want to track these specific bills. So if anything that happens on any of the bills we're tracking, I'll get an update about that. Um, even if someone just signs on as a co-sponsor or whatever it is. So I have found that website to be useful. And then just, that's for tracking things. And for just general um, political information, I think, again, I mentioned the Cook Political Report. Um, that's a fairly good, non-biased um, information site. I think Politico also does a, a good job, although it can be overwhelming, but you can get, you can set up email alerts from Politico on any issue under the sun that you get every morning in your email if you want. Um, or you can just check out their website. They have, they have the free website, and then they've got a political pro website, which, is, which costs money. But the free website, there's plenty of information there, um, which I think is fairly comprehensive. So those are two good websites where I get a lot of information. Um, 
when I'm looking for kind of just general what's happening at the what's happening it's all that's all federal information a um, little less obviously Denver Post is in the news channels here in Colorado is where I get my local news from but um, I think that about wraps it up here is our contact information again we'll be sending the slides out for the big finish um, We'll be sending these slides out so you have our contact information um, with you, but this is how to get hold of us, any one of us. And again, um, Megan is in D.C. right now, but you can get hold of her at these numbers. Um, and I don't think we have any questions in the chat thing. So does, does anybody have any questions before we sign off? Type them in now if you have any questions. Um, and I think some of the big key takeaways are that, yes, there's slides and the recording of this. We'll be sending out both of those. Please share, share them throughout your networks. And I think some of the big, big key takeaways are um, you will be hearing from us, right? Is that you can dabble or you can go big and you can be like Terry. She must get like 30 emails every morning as soon as she wakes up about what's going on. Um, but bottom line is, is you will be hearing from us, right? Um, and we want to hear from you. So sign on letters, our farm bill platform, summer tour schedules. We'll be sending all of this out, but please let us know what we can do. Um, for you as well, um, whether you're inviting us along or we, you actually sort of need our help in terms of reaching out and scheduling meetings and site visits with your delegation, we're there for the whole spectrum of ways we can work together. Um, so thank you so much. I see several of you have also actually already emailed me personally about activities you're up to. Keep it up. We love it. Um, thank you guys so much for your time and attention, and we will be in touch soon. Thank you.